Welcome to another one of the uh, ASM roundtables. Today we're going to be talking about the automotive uh, industry. I was at CES earlier this year and the automotive industry was really making, um, making a lot of impact, particularly driverless vehicles. Audi and Mercedes had bought driverless vehicles all the way up from Silicon Valley uh, to Las Vegas successfully on the roads um, without hitting anything. So uh, it, was, it was a big play there. But also we're seeing a lot of, lot of developments in terms of infotainment and our connected world being taken into the car. So stuff that we're using on our smartphone, we want to use in our car. So lots going on there. Collision between the supply chain of the automotive world, which is normally conservative, and the supply chain of the consumer electronics world, which is much faster moving. I want to bring up um, three guests to talk about this. Uh, first of all, Mark Northrup. Mark is from IEC Electronics, a contract manufacturer. Mark also has a huge amount of experience in the automotive sector um, with, with various different OEMs. Um, next, I want to bring up Jeff Timms. Jeff is from the placement division of, uh, of ASM Assembly Systems, and Brian Smith, who is from the print um, division. So we'll be able to comment on that side of it. What I want to explore, first of all, is really what are some of the trends that are driving automotive and, and, and making this change happen? Uh, if I can start with you, Mark, from your experience, obviously driverless is, is one of the ones that we're getting a lot of buzz about. But what's, what's really being manufactured and what's impacting on you as a contract manufacturer? Um, from a driver point of view, I'd say the first thing is the smartphones that you're carrying in your pocket right now, what's driving the same technology into the cars today. The user interface, for example, you guys want touch screens. Uh, two is as far as what you can do with your you know, phone yourself relative to what's already loaded into it. Um, that translates into my world from the electronic side is I have a distributed set of electronics within the body of the car now. Days of old, you had a centralized CPU into it. And now if I asked you how many CPUs in the car today, there's probably 30 to 60 of them underneath the hood of the car as well as in the body of the car. And in my manufacturing world, that makes it even more interesting because all this equipment that we have to use to place this on boards, the density of those boards become more complex, requires me to have better equipment to do that with. But keeping that simple, when I want to say infotainia and watch my kids watch TV in the back seat while I'm navigating with my GPS on the car screen, those are things I consider electronic toys, which I enjoy. I like that. So. Okay, so let's drive it out. Jeff, you're out with, um, with working with various different OEMs in the automotive world. What are, the, what, are they, what are they talking to you about in terms of their roadmap, in terms of looking forward? Yeah, uh, you know, Phil, I, I think one of the most significant areas is, uh, is becoming accident collision avoidance, right? Okay. You know, collision management. It's not just collision management anymore. It's collision avoidance. And really taking over the, uh, the guesswork from, from, uh, from the driver, taking that danger zone out of the, out of the hands of the driver. So you, you, if you look at that in combination with uh, all the sensor technologies that are, that are required to do that, we're seeing that section of the business uh, just exploding right now. Yeah. So the infotainment piece is, is huge, uh, but also uh, the legislated uh, uh, safety features that are, that are finding their way into the yeah. vehicles. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's driving a lot of manufacturing. Yeah, and I certainly like the idea of my collisions being avoided rather than managed. That Absol sounds absolutely. much more attractive to no me. No question. What about you, Brian? What are you seeing with the, with the customers you're speaking to? Yeah, it's, it's the same sort of thing that these guys mentioned. I think we're right on track here. I mean, you mentioned CES right at the top of this uh, conversation, and I went to CES 2014, mm. and it was incredible that it's become a car show. Yeah. You know, there, there, there are yeah. automotive companies there yeah. showing entire cars, not just modules and this and that, but, you know, the, 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 sa the safety features that are putting in the car, the, the efforts to make the car more autonomous, are really unbelievable. And people talk about driverless cars because that's the interesting thing. The idea of just sitting there while the car's driving itself sounds cool, but there's little steps you have to make on the way to get there. Like they show now the way you can park the car, parallel parking, without you having to actually do the work. Yeah. And, and that's one of the baby steps on the way. And these little things are gonna start taking over. And it, you know we're, we're still several years away from having a realistic, yeah. autonomously driven yeah. car, but we're getting there. And that's, yeah. that's really neat stuff. Yeah, and I think what they were talking about, and I think a term that we're hearing used for that is assisted driving, the idea of lane control, the idea of collision avoidance, the idea of parking. I, I think uh, it was Audi that were, were, were showing a demonstration where you could actually park your car with your finger on your iPhone, which is a, which is a pretty cool thing to be able to do. And, and the car's more reliable than a human being in terms of 
it knows where the vehicles are adjacent are. You can put your car in a space and not even need to open the door to get out. So that's, um, that's pretty cool. What kind of growth potential do you think there is in the sector? I think I read somewhere we're about $2,800 of electronics in a car at the moment. People are talking about figures of up to $4,000 for that. Do you think that's realistic, Mark? Um, absolutely, I think that's realistic. Um, I was in a presentation yesterday, and the numbers you're quoting are pretty spot on. Um, I think that the biggest reason why is if you look at the computer today and what you get for technology on it versus yesterday, it's far more sophisticated. Identically to the car, the features that we're all talking about, whether I want it safer because it can drive itself, whether I want it to be uh, more sophisticated in terms of whether or not it can see in different types of weather relative to infrared sensors. Sensors are a big thing now that's adding an additional value add to the car. And when you put this all together, what you're paying for for the price of the car in terms of the mechanical versus the mechanical electronics on it, the electronics is the margin that you know, we're, as consumers, we want that and we're going to pay for it. Yeah. And, and Jeff, from your point of view, that growth, where are you seeing that growth geographically? Is it, is it just in the traditional car manufacturing areas like Germany and Chicago? You, you know, I, 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 think, I think you're seeing huge growth, huge expansion in Canada, huge expansion in Mexico. Um, uh, I think with the exchange rates as they are uh, and, the, and the, uh, the, 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 the legacy installed base, uh, legacy uh, manufacturing base in these areas, first growth will be those two places. Yeah. Uh, certainly, additional growth in the Amer in, in, in U.S. Uh, and I think by the end of the year, you're going to start to see uh, some very significant growth in Brazil. Okay, okay. And and from your point of view, Brian, why do you think countries like Mexico are suddenly becoming more significant? I know we talked about Mexico yeah. yesterday, but it seems to be doing particularly well in the automotive yeah, sector. Yeah, of course. I mean, if you think about the electronics market on the whole, I would say that the three C's, the consumer, the computer, and, and the communication devices tend to more often come from Asia, but automotive tends to be the highest volume type of project that we see in the Americas. And, and from a low cost standpoint, from a supply chain standpoint, one of the best places in the world to produce those sorts of products is in Mexico. Yeah. And so we see no, no, we see no, nothing really stopping the growth <laughs> yeah. in the Mexican market to build car parts. That's really the biggest growth area for us. Yeah. And I, I, I think also a very significant point that, that cannot be ignored is the liability aspect of automotive electronics, right? And and the trust uh, in in the li from a liability management standpoint, the trust has to be there with your with your, with your supplier. And it, it's a lot better if you're in the same time zone or similar time zone. So yeah, you can, yeah. your engineers can talk to engineers real time. You're not yeah. up in the middle of the night trying to talk to somebody yeah. uh, that might be speaking a third language or a second yeah. language. And yeah. uh, I think it, 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 uh, it makes a big difference on, on the geographical placement of those uh, contracts. Yeah, and perhaps there isn't quite the, um, quite the price, the price driven demands that there are in, in other sectors. Mark, when you look at those, um, those, those sectors and you look at the collision between manufacturing consumer goods, which has a very specific style of volume manufacturing, and you look at manufacturing automotive parts where you've got high reliability issues. Now you see those worlds collide. What does that, what does that challenge you in terms of, of how you manufacture those products? Um, the answer to that, I would just start out of the gate, talk about coatings. In our world, uh, if you looked at commercial electronics, the uh, first environment, harsh environment they're being placed in, isn't as adverse. I go over to automotive now, and as a manufacturer of electronics that go into them, you as a user don't want to be able not to get into your car with a keyless entry because a solenoid won't lock because the electronics don't function. Okay, So <laughs> from a sophistication level, we all want it, but from a approved reliability performance because of what I'm explaining in terms of the environment, it's, in, it's forcing the commercial electronics to be put down as well as protected so that they will perform in these environments much longer. And it's very difficult because, uh, again, uh, Putting the parts down is easy, but when you got to coat them and do other things to it to make them more protective, that adds another layer of complexity to what we have to do from a manufacturing point of view. Okay, and um, Brian, when you when you're looking at it from a, a print point of view, what are the what are the automotive manufacturers demanding from you? Is it miniaturization and the kind of heterogeneous, the the normal stuff we see, or are there additional demands because of the environments they're in? Yeah, there's a few extra things. I mean, I think the miniaturization and heterogeneous assembly factors are, are in automotive for sure, so we do see a lot of those concerns. Um, also in automotive though, there's a lot of fail safe built into the process. The engineers, they want to be able to walk away from the line <coughs> and know that the operators can't make changes. Uh -huh. They don't have to, everything in the automotive world, if you make a process change, you have to document it and get it approved by your customer. Yeah. And that forces enough 
I guess, uh, concern about engineers wanting to sleep well at night, yeah. that they want fail-safes put into the process so things can't be changed, so they're documented, and, and those sorts of things are, are important to build into the entire process. Yeah, so the challenge then is you've got a robust process that's hard to change, but you still need to be flexible and fast-moving. How do you deal with that, Jeff? So it certainly places a, a great deal of pressure on the equipment suppliers to provide real true traceability uh, data, uh, real time, uh, but not just traceability data, uh, but uh, we, you know, as we were saying before, we are talking about uh, collision avoidance, it's also problem avoidance, right? So, so all of a sudden we're starting to see an increasing interest in electrical uh, uh, component uh, uh, testing and, <laughs> and, and things like this, all, all, all coming back into the world of being online parts of the process. So, so you can't take a chance uh, to, to, uh, to have the wrong component ever on a circuit, right? Uh, not only is it the world's harshest environment uh, in an automobile, uh, but if you consider the complexity involved in, in this thing that we call a car that's really a cradle of connectivity, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable that, that, that uh, we have the reliabilities that we do. Yeah, yeah so it's very, very demanding. Uh, I'd like to add one more comment as well as don't also think on top of the board. Uh, the technology that's in your phones is also in the board. That's right. So that brings a whole new dimension to this because now I've got to put embedded electronics into a circuit board for both power management, for reduction of spatial, as well as for efficiency, increase in terms of throughput. That's a whole new dimension from a manufacturing world because if I build the board, I don't fabricate the board. Am I gonna receive that as a part and then I'm gonna have to work with the people that give me the equipment that helps assemble it, how to address that and test it. So just one more variable that it adds to us that we have to be challenged by. Yeah, and as well as changes in the automotive industry, we're starting to see some changes in, the, in some of the business models. We're starting to see not just the automotive OEMs working in this sector we're starting to see more of particularly the large contract manufacturers having their own automotive divisions from your point of view mark is it is this an additional opportunity is this somewhere where you can bring together skills from two sectors to really bridge the gap between those industries uh, absolutely another example of that be is if we broke it out into traditional medical versus automotive versus industrial versus internet of things of today the iot market right now is approximately one trillion plus forecasted right now if I look at it in terms of the automotive, it's about mm, 500 billion. And when I start connecting the medical aspect to it, when you're in your car and I ask you the question, do you want to know what the wearables like I'm wearing today, can get you that same information while you're in the car. As an example, if you were going to fall asleep in your car, obviously if it wasn't unmanned, you'd like to know that before it occurred. So connecting those three market segments together, I just took 500 billion, increased it to you know 2.5 trillion. Yeah. So for me, that's you know, insurmountable. You just can't refuse to look at that. If I just looked at aerospace, which is getting smaller, again, I just crossed three of them and tied them together because of the connection that we just did with the Internet of Things. Yeah, and I think that's important. We're seeing a complete blurring of the lines between industries. And you talk about something that is a sensor and a seatbelt. Is that a wearable? Is that a medical device? Is that an automotive device, a consumer device? The answer is it's probably all of them. Last question I'd like to ask each of you is, given all this explosion in, in things that you, can, that you can have operating electronically in your car, what would be your what would be your what would be your first choice? For me, I like the idea of piloted vehicles in traffic. That traffic management thing, where I just hate driving in traffic. I want to be able to switch over, have lane control, stay the right distance behind the car in front. Mark, what would you choose? I'm a gamer, so anything I can have to enhance the game experience while I'm in that car, whether it says Xbox, whether it says PS, or whether it says something else, I'm all for it. You want to play Call of Duty while you're driving? I do, but probably my wife doesn't. Jeff. Yeah, you know, I, I think Phil, if I if I if I fast forward this industry uh, ten or fifteen years, uh, it will be a reality that driverless vehicles are a day-to-day -day occurrence in metropolitan areas. Yeah. Maybe I'm not so fond of of having a computer drive my car down the highway when I might want to go 100 miles an hour, uh, but by the time I come into a major metropolitan area uh, like Atlanta or LA or someplace. Like I want somebody else to take control, so yeah. I do have that fixed distance, and yeah. it's and, and you eliminate stoplights, and yeah. you eliminate stop signs, and you just zipper through yeah. uh, uh, the traffic lanes. Yeah. It's uh, that makes a whole lot of sense. So driverless Uber is Drive, what we're looking yes, for. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, from my standpoint, I've got young kids, so uh, I have a ten-year-old who's going to be going for his driver's license before I know it, and I want the car to be as safe as it can be because yeah. I don't know that I want to put him out there in the world that we live in now. I'd rather him have a safer car. I mean. I, I, you just don't know with kids how they're going to turn out, and mine I think will be all right, but 
you know, we'll see when the when, when he's 16 if he can handle being behind the wheel of a Put car. Put the game box in there. <laughs> we already have that in the in the back of the van. Put the game box in there. So isn't it strange how we don't want our children to take the risks we took? And right. we took much greater exactly. risks. Exactly. Right. We had no exactly. I didn't have a seatbelt growing up, did you? <laughs> seatbelt? <laughs> What's that? Guys, thanks very much for your Thank time. You. Really interesting conversation. I think it's going to be really exciting to see how this sector develops. Thanks very much for, for joining you. me up here. And Thank thanks, you, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Phil.